I'm Pastor Jonathan Gant at Living Faith Lutheran Church in Pembroke Pines, Florida. You know, I moved to Pembroke Pines with my wife Pam on March 1st, 2020, and, and who could have guessed at what our faith journey had in store for us on that day? That was a Sunday that we were traveling, and my wife and I were at Living Faith for our first Sunday on March 7th. It was great getting to meet folks, and I was so excited and nervous that that day was sort of a blur. I thought about that day as I left the building. Now, who was that person? Who was, who, uh, in what family did that person belong to? And all other kinds of questions. But I took solace by thinking, oh well, it takes time to get to know a church, and I'll see everybody again next week. That very next Sunday was to be Living Faiths and many other churches first worshiping online only experience. We didn't even get to say goodbye, and I didn't really even get to say hello. We didn't get to know one another. You know, while this is frustrating and sad and scary and the doors of our buildings have been shut, God has opened other doors. Our family of living faith is being transformed. We are seeing so many others joining us in our worship. We want to welcome you and wish you peace wherever you reside on our planet. If you so desire, if you are searching for a church family either to worship with in person or from afar, a family with which to share your joys and sorrows, your triumphs and failings, your hopes and fears, we want you to know you are welcome. And I would be remiss if I did not make everyone aware that you can subscribe to our newsletters and find my contact information at livingfaithlutheran.org. I will admit, our church and the broader church was caught off guard by this pandemic, and we're trying to catch up with what it means to be the people of God online and assuring that all people have access to their pastor, to their church family, be it virtually or sitting physically face to face. The church has never ceased to worship and carry out its mission, although in new and innovative ways. We all need to be part of this conversation because a pandemic cannot stop the Holy Spirit. And God will continue to open doors and unite God's children in new and exciting ways each and every day. So as we continue on our journey, I want to take opportunities for everyone listening to get to know uh, us and to help me find more in ways for us to get to know one another and to be what God wants us to be and that is a loving community that embraces all people as brothers and sisters despite all those things that we as humans have decided should divide us. Thank you and let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. So that we may live and serve you in a newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Your sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout out loud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humbled and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the end of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, O prisoner of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you double. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over to all he has made. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The kingdom is everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 7, verses 13 to 25. Did what is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin working death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery unto sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree the law is good. But in fact, it is not longer that I do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will that is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want, is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that I do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my innermost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of the sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then my mind, I am slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am slave of the law of sin. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. 
But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and, and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have bidden these things, excuse me, you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I see the Gospel for today, and I hear the word burden, I think about the character Christian in the book Pilgrim's Progress and his huge backpack that he carries. I saw a movie very tightly based on the book, and it was, it was very interesting, especially given its historical impact and importance. However, it was also quite troubling. You see, Christian begins carrying this huge backpack, his burden. He makes his way along the journey of life through different symbolic trials, and he meets other characters with symbolic names until he comes to the cross of Christ. His backpack pops off and it tumbles down the hill and disappears into the open tomb of Jesus. Well, the story and the journey continues with Christian trying to make his way to the celestial city or heaven. The troubling aspect of this story was its sole focus on achieving the goal of entry and meeting obstacles that Christian had to overcome or resist or avoid to prove worthiness for entry. Christian has to earn the golden ticket to get in. All of the trials, all of the focus was centered inwardly on himself. It was all about Christian and his journey, his worthiness. Therefore, the journey was just a test for individuals to navigate to the real moment of meaning, entry into the celestial city. Now, from a Lutheran perspective, we might say that John Bunyan's Christian has embarked on a journey of the, on the path of glory, or has a theology of glory. In contrast to the, to the theology of glory stands the theology of the cross. Luther was the first to make this distinction, and, make all the, and it makes all the difference, as you will see, in what the journey looks like. According to Luther, the theology of the cross preaches what seems foolish to the world. That's from 1 Corinthians. In particular, the theology of the cross preaches that, one, humans can in no way earn righteousness. Two, humans cannot add to or increase righteousness of the, cro the righteousness of the cross. And three, any righteousness given to humanity comes from outside of us. In contrast, in Luther's view, the theologian of glory preaches that, one, humans have the ability to do the good that lies within them. Two, there remains after the fall some ability to choose the good. And, humans can, and three, humans cannot be saved without participating in or cooperating with the righteousness given by God. I'll be honest. 
I didn't set out to teach a theology lesson. I set out thinking about an old hymn. When I saw the words of, of Scripture, my mind immediately started hearing, I'm going to lay down my burden down by the riverside. Well, why the riverside? This is the moment of baptism where our sins are washed away and we are reborn children of God and inheritors of eternal life. It's where that burden backpack is laid down. However, that does not stop us from searching out, procuring, or investing in other burdens that weigh us down in life. For instance, feeling that we have to earn something that we were freely given in salvation. In my research, while I was freshening up on my bunion and Pilgrim's Progress, I actually came across a faith story written last year at about this time for Living, the Living Lutheran magazine. I found it because the author actually referenced the work. Liz Lenz told her story of growing up with a Bunyan-esque theology and its impact on her. She wrote, Each church taught me that as a woman, I should be quiet and submissive, with motherhood being my highest calling, finding a husband my greatest blessing. I was taught to believe in an apocalypse in which God's wrath would rain from the sky, that my gay, queer, and trans friends were all going to hell. The religion of my childhood was about striving, but never achieving, of being subordinate, ruled over, never good enough. By high school, I was exhausted. I wanted out. I read Friedrich Nietzsche and Simone de Beauvoir, uh, excuse me, Beauvoir in the school library during lunch, and I longed to be the inverse of Bunyan's Christian. I wanted to be the, to be the bell tower of, of the liberal college to serve as a symbol of unbelief. I would kneel before it, the weight of my faith would tumble off, and I would be able to breathe. Liz found faith again in a theology of the cross after laying down all the other burdens she had collected, as it turns out. So you might ask, what's this theology of the cross look like? Is it burden gone, free pass, see you later at the pearly gates? I'm in, no problems for me. No, no it's not. It is burden gone, sins forgiven. But whereas in Christian's journey, he walks away empty-handed after the cross, Burn down, relief. Now, just be careful not to blow it until you die and you get into the celestial city with the cross seemingly left in the past. This part is not so when following a theology of the cross. This path would immediately ask Christian to deny himself and take up his cross and follow Jesus. The cross of Christ points us outward to others, away from a focus upon ourselves and getting our reward for successful testing. It says in our post-communion liturgy that Christ not only gave himself as a sacrifice for sin, but as a model of the godly life. Because the strain of our burden is being taken up by Jesus, it is thankfulness that propels us to emulate Jesus' life of ministry. Jesus focused his attention, grace, love, and healing, and action on a hurting world and hurting people. He chose the path of the cross and self-denial and the role of the suffering servant, helping others to carry their burdens in life, freeing the oppressed, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, bringing healing, fighting for justice, proclaiming God's grace and love and the message of the cross that propels us to do such things. And thinking about that joyous moment of burdens being lifted in our lives, the weight of sin being washed away in baptism and Christ teaching us, I thought about that old spiritual, O oh, happy day. It recalls this happiness and continues on. He taught me how to watch, fight, and pray, and live rejoicing every day. These are actions. This is our calling and our mission. 
Jesus recognizes this as a burden and a yoke, but for the humble it is easy and light. We must watch. We must open our eyes and see the needs around us. Watch for opportunities. Watch for injustice. Watching requires our eyes be open and receptive. For the proud and powerful taking up the cross and the burdens of others is foolish and just way too much to bear, so they refuse to see that path. But don't you think we already know? Could we actually be completely oblivious despite all the times loving one another and caring for others, especially the oppressed, and, is, and, and easily forgotten is mentioned and commanded in the Bible? In 1738, Jonathan Swift wrote, There are none so blind as those who will not see. The most deluded people are those who choose to ignore what they already know which was inspired actually by the fifth chapter of Jeremiah. Jesus promised, uh, Jesus pointed this out with his little joke about taking a beam out of your own eye before removing a sliver from someone else's. If we open our eyes, how often are we going to be found doing gymnastics to shadow, avoid, not see what we know is actually there? I see nothing. This is not happening. Closing our eyes with our hands over our ears saying, la, 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 la. With eyes open, we are then called to fight, to act, to repent, to change. Not just to stop doing wrong, but to do right. The prophet Micah says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The path of the cross is about joining the fight against the forces of evil that cast a long shadow upon the most vulnerable and bearing the light of Christ to those afflicted through word and deed. To have the ability to act and to discern, we must pray. Pray to not come into temptation. Pray to have the strength and courage to fight. Pray that our eyes and hearts be open, that we have hearts overflowing with thankfulness. Pray for the Spirit's guidance, compassion, and motivation, and for the humility to acknowledge our sins against God and against one another and the courage to ask for forgiveness, and also the compassion of Christ to forgive those who have sinned against us. As I said before, the life of the cross, the life of a follower of Jesus, is driven by thankfulness and what is rejoicing other than a heart overflowing with thankfulness. As we take up the cross of Christ, I believe that is a joyful, thankful heart that makes for a light burden as we consider what Jesus first did for us. Share that joy. Live in that happy day and lay down that burden that you can never earn and witness the overflowing joy in the eyes and hearts of those whom you serve. Watch fight and pray and live rejoicing every day. Amen.
Let us make a confession of our faith, the faith in which we baptize with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Call into unity one another and the whole creation. Let us pray for our shared world. We pray for the church. Sustain us as we share your word. Embrace us as we struggle to find the common ground. Lift up leaders with powerful and prophetic voices. Free us from stagnant faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Free us from apathy in our care of creation and direct us towards sustainable living. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the nations, especially the United States and Canada, celebrating our nationhood. Guide leaders in developing just policies and guide difficult conversations. Free us from patriotism that hinders relationship building. Lead us to expansive love to our neighbor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all in need, for all who are tired, feeling despair, sick or oppressed. We pray especially for your servants on our prayer list, those who are suffering the far-reaching ill effects of COVID-19, and for those whom we name out loud or in silence in our hearts. Take their yoke upon you and ease their burdens. Give your consolation and free us from all that keeps us abound. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray, we pray for our congregation and our ministry. Invigorate us through your spirit of innovation that we might actualize vibrant new methods to reach out to our hurting world. Breathe on us your spirit of inspiration that we might be filled with will, courage, and zeal to proclaim your word and make your love, justice, and peace known. Send us your spirit to carry out our offering of worship and the word throughout the world according to your will and strengthen us in service and in for God, your mercy is great. We give thanks for those who have died in faith. Welcome them into your eternal rest and comfort us in, your, in our grief until we are joined with them in new life. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I'd like you to take this opportunity to pause the video and to uh, give someone a call and share the peace of God with them. Also, this is the time that we normally would uh, celebrate Holy Communion, but given uh, 
the, the precariousness of, of COVID-19 uh, for the safety of our parishioners, we are uh, declaring and, and uh, abiding by a communion fast at this time. But take this time to uh, build community with one another, to share God's love, to share his peace uh, with one another that uh, we might be spiritually in communion with one another. Now let us pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now may God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.